Barry. <sighs> Naturally smoking a cigarette, as I always do. Oh, mon dieu! Bonjour, fellow masters. You know, j'adore, I love the strawberry wine and the fresh bottle. Fresh bottle. And a new bottle. There's nothing better. <laughs> Let us try one. The bottle is empty. The bottle is empty. No. That can't be good. Well, looks like we're gonna make strawberry wine then. It's not very hard and there aren't a lot of ingredients. So let's get to it and as always, let's screw up together. I start by hulling the strawberries and that's just a matter of taking the little leafy bit off the top and throwing the strawberries into a bowl. I've got 12 pounds to go through, so it's gonna take a hot minute and I'll do it in a couple of rounds. When I pick the strawberries, I like to get them so they're, you know, really, really ripe or just overripe. And that really produces a nice sweet juice. Got a few chickens walking in the background. Who knows what nonsense they'll get up to. Now all the strawberries are prepared. It's time to smush them. And I used to use a potato smasher and that worked fairly well. You don't get a whole lot of juice though. You could also put them in the blender if you wanted. It creates a lot of pulp and it creates sort of a mess when you try to rack the wine. So some time ago, almost 10 years ago now, we got this, it's a cider press. So you put your apples in here or pears, whatever you want. You chop them up, they fall in the bucket. And this screw would press them. We don't need to chop anything up because the strawberries are really, really soft. But um, this is what we're gonna use. You get a lot of juice out of it. We might get maybe a gallon or so of juice, who knows? Now it's time to get to it. First, I need to lubricate the screw, and this is some food grade silicone. As usual, there's a few components to talk about. There's this sort of bottom plate, it goes here. I think it's mostly supposed to be kind of like a pre filter for if any little chunkies of apples or whatever get in there. I'll kind of stop that. Could be wrong. Been wrong about other things in this world. Um, this is just a bottomless bucket and we're going to have a little bag full of strawberries we're going to put in here and this plate will go on top and the screw will press down here and this will, you know, gradually squish berries. There's a hole right here. The juice will come out of, we'll have a jug. And uh, Bob's your uncle, strawberry juice. Chickens are getting just a little too curious about these strawberries. They'll never fall down from there, said nobody ever. I have about 12 pounds of strawberries, so we'll have to smush these in a few rounds. The mesh bag I'm using was too small for this bucket. And you'll see that I just kind of gave up and just put it in the bucket itself.
kind of have to tilt it this way and that. Got a few shims and everything to try to direct the liquid to that drain a little better. But uh, we're on a hill. Nothing's flat, and really, who lives on a flat yard anyway? On March of Progress, 1934, we go across the pond now to visit our chappies in merry old England, where here we find the flattest yard. In Derby upon Dwee, button farmer Harry Hunks receives a stupendous award. Local professor and crackpot Dalen Quace Carbuncle presents Mr. Hunks with this commemorative plaque. Even the local buffoon joins in the celebration. Mr. Hunks, how do you feel about this great honor? This is the happiest day of my life. And when precisely did you know you had a flat yard? It was upon the second viewing of the property that I realized that it was land of particular flatness. Mrs. Hunks, how do you feel about this great achievement? I'm very proud of my husband. This is a very special day for him. And when did you start to grow that luxurious beard? I have a beard. Until next time, keep marching on. We ended up with, uh, say that's a little more than three quarters of a gallon. That's really going to make the difference. Um, we'll keep that pulp too, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Not bad. The strawberry wine that I'm making is based upon an older recipe that I can't remember where I got it from. Probably an online recipe. And you can get recipes virtually anywhere, books online, you know, just wing it. Probably, probably don't do that. But, uh, this particular one I just have written down in a notebook with all the notes of what's worked and what hasn't worked over the years. And so this is just the one I use. Works out for me. But yeah, check out all the resources that there are available if you're interested in making strawberry wine or any kind of wine in that matter. There's kits. You can get big 96 ounce jars of uh, fruit juice and pulp. Options are endless. So this particular recipe we're making is very simple. And the way I did it is for every gallon of liquid, we add like a teaspoon or, or one of something. So there's five of each ingredient in here. So putting this little mortar right now is a mixture of acid blend and yeast nutrient, both of which are one teaspoon per gallon. Next thing I'm adding, which is grape tannin, is an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon. And the last thing you see me add is pectic enzyme, which I put about a half a teaspoon per gallon. And then I just grind it up and put it aside till I'm ready for it. It's just easier to dissolve in the liquid when it's all ground up like this. Next thing they do is to pour out the juice and add some water to make five gallons. So what I'm doing here is looking at the diluted juice through a refractometer. And what that does, it tells me the solid content in the liquid. In this case, the solid is sugar and the scale used is degrees in bricks. So on this scale, one degree bricks is one gram of sucrose sugar in 100 grams of solution, and that's the juice mixture. What you do is you put a drop of liquid on a prism and press it down with a little flap. And there's a scale in the viewfinder that looks similar to this. With this juice mixture, I'm reading a Brix of roughly 1.5. Now everything for wine is measured in specific gravity, not Brix. So we'll have to convert the Brix to specific gravity. The equation is as followed. Now, I'm no Pythagoras, so I can't explain the constants in this equation, but I do know how to operate a calculator. And when we plug everything in, we get a specific gravity of 1.0058. I like my strawberry wine on the sweeter side, so I like to start the wine around 1.11. So that means we're gonna have to add several pounds of sugar. So I know that in five gallons of water, one pound of sugar raises the specific gravity by about 0.0. 009. So if I were to add 12 pounds of sugar, that would raise the specific gravity by 0 0.108, and added to what we already have would bring it to 1.1138, right where we want it. And now that the math lesson's over, it's time to add the sugar. So we put it in some hot water, dissolve it, and add it to the wine mixture. So I'm going to measure the specific gravity with a hydrometer. And it looks like we've got a reading of 1.121.
Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself, well, that's not the number you said it was going to be. Well, you got a lot of nerve pointing that out. Now, there's a couple of possible reasons why this is. Uh, it could be that the sugar wasn't quite measured right or that the refractometer wasn't uh, calibrated correctly. So either way, the number is really not that much bigger. So I think we're still good. So you just keep your comments to yourself. Now it's time to talk about the yeast. Now, you, me, King Kong, we belong to the animal kingdom. Yeast are single-celled organisms that belong to the kingdom fungi. Their sole job in the winemaking process is that they convert sugar into alcohol. And so that leads us to a particular question. Why does the sugar turn into alcohol and not something else? So what I have here is just a little experiment that we can use to observe the yeast. And this is something you could do at home and you could do it with your kids, your family, your friends, whatever. It's really simple to do. And I've got just my yeast right here in this dish. This is the yeast we're gonna be using. And I have um, like a rug. And what we're gonna accomplish here is actually quite incredible. We're gonna be able to observe the single cells of yeast in action without any water or anything like that. It's actually really cool. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our piece of rug or carpet and we're just gonna kind of rub our hands on the carpet and just do that for, you know, what was that? Five, 10 seconds. Then you just kind of, kind of surprises you when it happens. And then when you wait a second, just set that over here a little bit. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, I, I cannot believe this. Look, it's it's Mr. Yeast. Can you believe this? Mm. Yes, well, call me Yancey. Mr. Yeast is my father. Um, right, yeah, uh, Yancey, sure. Um, just let me, uh, <clears throat> just kind of scooch down a little bit here. It's incredible. You know, Yancey, uh, I wish we had more time, but the fact of the matter is my audience retention rate is absolutely terrible. And so we kind of have to get to the point here. And so the question on everybody's mind is, how do you, Yancey, turn sugar into alcohol? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, what's your name now? Oh, uh, well, my name my name's Ryan. Yes, Ryan, I'm glad you asked. You see, a glucose molecule is broken down in a process called glycolysis, and that creates two pyruvate molecules. This reaction is used to phosphorylate two ADP molecules, making two ATP molecules, and also reduce two molecules molecules and getting off two molecules of carbon dioxide. In the final... And there it is! Alcohol! Wait, were you even paying attention to any of that? What? What? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, fart, carbon dioxide, poop, alcohol, of course, yeah, you know. Uh, you, you see, uh, Yancey, that's all really the time we have, so uh, I'm just gonna try to... Wait, what are you doing there, anyways? <laughs> Hey, did you just kill that googly guy? Uh, no. No, he's, he's fine. He, he's just fine. Yeah. Fine. So the trick here is I've got a little bit of wine in this ramekin, and I'm going to dump the yeast in there and let it proof for about 10 minutes. If proof is the right word, then that is what we're doing. And then when that's done, dump it in the bucket. Time for the implements of destruction. So we're gonna rack the wine, and here's a pulp from the strawberries that I had. And that makes a really awesome red color. So we need our auto siphon. This little funnel goes into the top of the carboy. Makes it very convenient for that tube. And a few pumps of the auto siphon inner tube and the siphon starts itself. Uh, so long as the wine is above what we're pouring the liquid into, it will just automatically flow from this point on. Okay. 
and I'll awkwardly put the bung and airlock on while I'm looking at the camera at the same time. And once we put the airlock on, within a couple of minutes, the yeast is already starting to work. That's pretty much it. And essentially, it's just going to sit there for the next several months uh, fermenting. Eventually, I'll stop the fermentation, and I'll probably do a follow-up like mini video about that. And every so often, every few weeks or so, there's sediment that will build up. And I'll rack the wine into another carboy, just like we did from the bucket to the carboy. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying what you see on the channel, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, don't forget to hit the bell icon for any notifications from future videos. See you on the next one.